Hi, my name is Maya Yamato, and I'm the Peter Buck Postdoctoral Fellow in VZ and Paleobiology. There are two suborders of cetaceans, toothed whales and baleen whales. Tooth whales include dolphins and porpoises, and baleen whales don't have teeth and include this humpback whale here, as well as the blue whale, which is the largest animal on Earth, fin whale, minke whale, right whale, and so on. In an underwater environment where light attenuates quickly, cetaceans have evolved to rely on their ears for survival. So tooth whales have developed a sophisticated um, biosonar ability called echolocation, and they can image their surroundings using their sense of hearing. Echolocation hasn't been demonstrated in baleen whales, but baleen whales produce low-frequency vocalizations that travel far underwater to communicate with conspecifics. Unfortunately, the, uh, humans are making the oceans a noisier place, which may be having a negative impact on these whales. However, um, in, under to, in order to understand the effects of human-made noise on whales, we need to learn a little bit more about how and what they hear. So hearing in tooth whales is pretty well studied. This is a bottom nose dolphin viewed from the side and the ventral view, which is bottom up. So an air-filled ear canal is not effective underwater, so um, the blue ear canal is vestigial. Instead, tooth whales hear through specialized acoustic fats that run along the lower jaws and lead to the ears, which are shown in purple there. Tooth whales also are known to produce and receive high-frequency sounds that they use for echolocation, and they have excellent hearing. In contrast to the tooth whales, which are well studied, we don't, we don't really know that much about uh, hearing in baleen whales. So we don't know their hearing range, we don't know their hear hearing sensitivities, and we don't even know how sound gets from the environment to the ears. So I decided to tackle this problem using an interdisciplinary approach using um, anatomy, chemistry, and engineering techniques. So here's me dissecting a minke whale in Cape Cod. So these are all whales that beach themselves naturally. Um, so on the bottom left, I'm CT scanning a whole whale head, but sometimes uh, you couldn't fit a whole whale head into the CT scanner, so I had to hand saw a small section of the head surrounding the ears. And here's what we found. So, you know, we didn't know, but baleen whales also have fats that lead up to the ears. So it looks a little bit different from the toothed whale acoustic fats, but here they are in yellow, leading up to the ears in purple. And these tissues have been described previously in the context of the jaw joint, but no one had looked at the association with the ears or the resulting implications for sound reception. If you look at a closer uh, look at the ears, you can see that the fats insert into the ear complex and attach the three little ossicles or the ear bones that lead up to the cochlea in the inner ear. So we see that there's fats in these baleen whale heads and they attach to the ears, but are they actually important? Here I've extracted lipids from four different individuals. Um, so the yellow represents the ear fat and the blue represents blubber. And what I want you to see is that one of the individuals was emaciated. It had an entanglement rope around its neck and it, it was unable to feed and starved and, and died. <laughs> um, and you can see that the blubber lipids are really uh, leached compared to the robust and thin individuals. Um, but in contrast, the ear, fat lipids are, uh, the ear fats are still made of over 50% lipid. So even in desperate times, they're conserving these lipids for some reason. Um, the acoustic fats of tooth whales are also conserved under starvation. Here I've modeled the sound, um, sound propagation through a whale head using the finite element method. This program simulates an incoming plane wave going through a virtual box of seawater with a model of a whale head inside. And red represents high sound in intensity and blue represents low sound intensity. What we found was that the presence of the ear fats adjacent to the, to the ears slightly increases the sound intensities by the ears. So it, um, it helps to focus sound towards the ears. So in summary, both toothed and baleen whales may hear through fats. The lipids and the ear fats are conserved under starvation, and the fats seem to help focus sound towards the ears. But I primarily studied the minke whale, which is one of the smallest of the baleen whale species. So what about the other baleen whales? Fortunately, we're at the Smithsonian, which has the largest marine mammal collection in the world. And we also have access to strandings all over the place. This is a gray whale that stranded in Washington State in April 2012. So um, there's Charlie Potter in green and me in yellow dissecting the gray whale. And thanks to the generosity of Matt Clope, the Whidbey Island Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and the US Navy, this, this specimen was cleaned and flown across the country to become the first um, complete California gray whale specimen in our collections. And in addition to the strand, uh, recent stranded collections, um, we also have old specimens from back in the whaling days. This is a blue whale fetus that was collected in 1936, and it's been sitting in an alcohol jar ever since. And um, we haven't really done much with it because these are very rare, irreplaceable specimens, and we haven't wanted to do any destruct destructive sampling. 
But thanks to modern biomedical imaging techniques, we're, allowed, we're able to uh, look at these specimens um, in depth without destroying them. So this is another specimen. This is a bowhead whale fetus that was uh, collected in Barrow, Alaska in 1976, and it's been sitting in our freezer ever since. <laughs> um, so with, the thanks, with thanks to uh, Bruno Froelich and Matt Tosheri from the anthropology department, we were able to CT scan this whale um, at the museum last month. And to date, we've CT scanned maybe 14 or 15 whale fetuses. And there's a lot more to go. And it's really uh, awesome how we have these crazy specimens that haven't been touched yet. And, um, and we have a lot of resources thanks to interdepartmental collaborations as well as the, the digitization, digitization office of the Smithsonian um, and the 3D guys. So I think it's a really exciting time to be at the museum. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the museum, the Peter Buck Postdoctoral Fellowship for allowing me to be here, the, uh, my previous institutions, the Stranding Networks, and collaborators both inside and outside of the museum. And um, I just want to highlight Jim Mead, who's the retired curator of marine mammals at the institution. And uh, when I grow up, I want to be just <laughs> like him. <laughs> Okay, I, I spoke fast enough, so I get one question. <laughs> Any questions? How big is that um, blue whale? The blue whale felis is about 30 centimeters long. So we started with um, we started with the smaller specimens because they're easy to haul from uh, Suitland. But um, in the coming months, I want to go into the big tanks and uh, get the bigger specimens out. So thanks to anthropology and the CT scanner. Why did no one look at Yeah, I was amazed too when I started my thesis, and then I realized it was a huge pain to look at the, look at big baleen whales. 